Thanks to L.L. Bean for presenting today's storybook with limited commercial interruption. Maine's deep in agricultural. It's got deep roots. It has always survived on its own. I'm impressed by Maine farmers. And even though that so many farms I know are not certified organic, they practice everything they can to the best of their abilities. Yeah. To keep their food safe for their family as well. I've been farming 37 years. I started very young, enjoyed every day of it. I hate that people think squash are decorative. Well, they'll they're come gorgeous. in and buy these incredible works of nature's art and, and put them on display until they rot on the doorstep, which I don't mind them decorating, but please bring them in because this squash is intimidating, but all you have to do is bake it in an oven, eat what you want, and scoop the meat into a freezer bag. In January and March, you'd never even know it was frozen. I, I wish they'd eat them because they're such favorites. Now there are even some of these gourds are edible because they've crossed them with pumpkins and varieties of squash. That's where all these gourd varieties are coming from. All pumpkins are derived by winter squash, so it's a, they call them two separate families, but they're really not. They're still a vine crop and they're all squash, and it even includes gourds. The plants and all of the new varieties of seeds, and they're making smaller things and more personalized squashes, so you don't have to raise a 20 pound pumpkin anymore, you know. I went with a lot of new varieties of squash, some up and coming like Cornell, Oregon State, they're trying to change things and personalize some of these squash and get them down smaller. This is a commitment. Yeah. You see an old lady dragging it out, you know? Huge commitment to work a giant 20 pound squash. So the Nantucket pie yeah. was on a whaling ship from St. George's Island. Um, made it into Nantucket. It was just called the pie pumpkin. And that's originally what they looked like, not so much this. Most all pumpkins probably derived from something like this pumpkin right here. Every country in the world or every spot has some remnants of a natural squash, whether it be summer or winter. This one is Rouge de Detomp. It's nicknamed Cinderella. It's an heirloom and it is native to North America. This is Jaharadale, known mostly to New Zealand. This one is Turk's Turban. It's native that they know of, the Argentina. This is Delicata, native to the North Americas, given to the settlement, European settlers. They all got heritages from somewhere, but like I said, they, they moved before. around stuff in their pockets and seeds and hundreds. I mean, they've got butternut squash dating back to 7,500 BC. They found it in caves and stuff in Utah. I like that they were an easy crop. Okay. You plant them, you feed them, and we, we cover them, and then you just keep the weeds off from them, and then the weeds the leaves get so big, they just cover in such a massive spot that the weeds won't even grow. And then from there on out, they just take care of themselves. And then as the warm weather and as it gets cooler, the vines just drop and the whole field is exposed and you get to see everything. 
That's but exciting. you wouldn't get to see it for over months. So Bef all that hard work paid off. Or you go, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen with global warming. That's yeah. a whole problem. Yeah. We just don't have the cool climate. We're getting warmer and warmer, like everything's getting warmer. We're going to have to start moving our times and dates as what, how we plant. We're probably gonna go, when we're usually done end of October, I mean, with global warming, we could still be at it in December. I'm also a flower farm fresh and dried. The most money I make on the whole farm is the flowers. Believe it or not, the flowers make more money than food. That's just wrong, isn't it? I've always been a person who believes that everybody should have flowers and they shouldn't cost more than food. And I know that the floristry industry is gonna hate me because for even saying it, but it's true. Every little kid, we try to make sure we have little bunches or flowers or singular flowers. Anybody who wants a flower. Did COVID affect you all for better or worse? Not really. We just made sure we grew limited and we didn't know if we'd have a farmer's market, but spacing and that worked out in the public. Wow, they really supported the market. It goes right from the field right to the public. I mean, no stop. It lands from our boxes after we wash it right within 24 hours to the public, and that's pretty exciting. My curiosity about any product that I grew just drove me to want to know about it. If you get involved with finding new ideas and new varieties, and you bring it another country's varieties to hear, you'll encourage the restaurants to use it. So in the end, it excites me to be able to bring new product and stuff that comes from around the world and varieties. I was a child that grew up with food insecurities and I know how important it is. It's the root of all the issues that children face. Here at Portland Public Schools, we have a wonderful opportunity to work with Native Maine. We like to focus on those local foods that we can offer to the students, proteins as well as the fresh fruit and vegetables. Encouraging your students to participate in school lunch helps us to reduce that stigma and for those kids that really do need those meals. And welcome back to Plate the State. Thank you to Hancock Lumber for letting us use their beautiful studio kitchen at their Kenny Bunk Design showroom. And because we are still in the holiday spirit, this is the second of our double Thanksgiving episode. Last week we focused on turkey stuffing and pan sauce, and this week we are focusing on pies, appetizers, and side dishes using a lot of the gorgeous squashes that Robin gave us from Beckwith Farm. So let's go see what Josh is cooking up today. And this is one of my favorite times of year because I can eat pie for breakfast without getting yelled at. <laughs> no one will ever yell at Maggie for eating pie for breakfast and she does so on the reg, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, we're gonna start off with making some pie. Okay. And Robin had so many great squashes over there. I was originally gonna make a pumpkin pie for this episode, but with all of the different squashes that she had, I wanted to showcase them and yeah. doing like a heirloom autumn squash pie that will be even better. So to start with our pie, we're gonna make pie crust. I think our friends at Rosemont make an incredible pie crust. I mean, I use it all the time. Mm -hmm. By keeping the pie dough in the fridge overnight, it thaws out, but still keeps the butter nice and solid. Mm -hmm. So you can get some nice rolls out of this evenly. So when we roll our pie dough out, we wanna give it just enough room so there's a little bit of overhang on our pie plate. All right, so when you're ready, we're gonna take this and then we just wanna pick up just a little bit and then roll it off. Maggie, if you could please hand me that pie plate and then we'll drape this right back over. And this Rosemont dough, it will let, it will give a little bit so it doesn't like really tear. You just wanna really just put that in and then you can add whatever 
crimping method that you like to, to do. Okay, great. Now that we have the crimping done on the side, Maggie, why don't you put that in the fridge so that butter will stay nice and firm. And when you come back, bring the blender up. Oh. So I'm gonna show everybody how to put the inside of the pie together. Evaporated milk, brown sugar, one of the eggs from our chickens, some spices, a little bit of cornstarch, and lastly, we have our nice heirloom squash. Uh, I just boiled this for about 15 minutes just to get it nice and tender and then cooled it back down, okay? Basically, we're gonna take all of this stuff, we're gonna pop it in our blender and blend it up, okay? Yeah. I'll crack the egg while you start shaving some of the spices in there. Okay. Egg in there. All right. Just mixing this up on high till it's smooth? Yep, we're gonna start on low. Okay. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's perfect. Nice. Okay. I want to grab the pie shell out of the fridge. Nice. And now we're just going to take that custard mixture and we're just going to pour it. Okay. Between the Rosemont pie dough and that. I always thought pies took forever to make and you just made that so easy. Not really. And you'll <laughs> notice that this doesn't come up super full, but what's going to happen is it's going to souffle up mm -hmm. and then settles down. That's what happens with all these squash pies. Okay. So easy to make. This is going to take about 50 minutes at about 350 degrees. When it, as soon as it comes out, let it rest for a little bit first. So I know that Maggie wouldn't be able to wait this long for pie. So luckily I have one that's already made. And I did this yesterday, so that's what it will come out to look oh, like. Oh, so pretty. Right? Oh, and of course the whipped cream. Always makes and, it come back. <laughs> yeah, and you gotta have that nice whipped cream. And so when it comes to whipped cream, you can just garnish it however you want. This is just a um, little whipped cream. Uh, there's a little bit of sugar in it, um, but some cinnamon or any of those fun spices we can get in there. And one thing that Josh did to help all of us, I, I live off of sticky notes. And one thing that Josh put together is he put a timeline on suggestions of when you can be cooking things for your Thanksgiving so you're not trying to cram everything in an oven when there's a giant turkey in there. And you can find that on PlateFeastate.com. Yeah, I'll make that so much easier for you guys. <laughs> So this is always the fun part when Josh realizes that I actually ate most of the whipped cream and he has run out to finish the pie. So he's going to go bake more so we can show you what this will look like at the end. And when we come back, we are also going to be making side dish and appetizers for our Thanksgiving feast. Sorry. <laughs> would be most surprised by our great selection of not only fresh fish but local products. We wanted to have a good mix of things that you don't see everywhere and things that you can't get that are both world-renowned as gourmet items and things that really make Maine special. My goal throughout my career has to, been to remove intimidation because it's wine. It's supposed to be fun. Everyone here has a specialty and they can make it really approachable. Hi, welcome to today's chef tip. We're gonna talk about how to make the best mashed potatoes. There's a few tricks that I use to do it. One is after you get some nice local potatoes, wash them, right? They're grown in the ground, we gotta rinse them off, okay? Uh, a lot of people use peelers, I don't, because I feel that with a peeler, you end up throwing the peels out or going into the compost bin. I like trimming my potato up, a couple reasons. It gives me a nice flat surface so I don't roll around on them, and then, I end up taking these wedge pieces, cutting them up, and then they go right into the oven with a little bit of salt on them, and they're great for a little roasted potato french fry that we all eat as snacks as the meal is getting ready, right? That's the best part. And now there's like no waste. But back to mashed potatoes. Once you have this trimmed up, you wanna cut your potatoes into nice big chunks, okay? If they're too small, they'll just disintegrate up, okay? So we wanna cut our potatoes into nice big chunks, and that way they'll cook evenly, okay? We wanna start our potatoes in cold water first. 
If we put our potatoes in hot water, the outside of the potato will start to like mash before the inside's done. And then you can get like that kind of hard, chunky potato. So again, we got these nice big chunks of potatoes here. All right. So this is the potatoes that we want. If you're not ready to cook them right off the top, just rinse them off with a little bit of water. Okay, so we have some potatoes that have been boiling for about 20 minutes now. You wanna check them, take one out, um, and they just want to be able to crumble just to break evenly. And as you can tell, they're nice and cooked through, okay? Now our milk here, this is just whole milk, okay? Just at a simmer, all right? I like to put my cracked pepper in there now. It gives the pepper time to like bloom in with the milk, okay? And that way it will kind of soften the pepper a little bit and really infuse the cream, all right? Now that everything's infused, we're gonna bring our potatoes over to our strainer, strain the water out and start mixing. Now remember with mashed potatoes, everything hot, okay? So we have warm milk, this is just some room temperature butter, okay? I um, just wanna mix that in there just until it starts to release from the whisk. You wanna just whip the butter in with the milk and make sure everything is combined. There we go. Now we're gonna take our potatoes, put them right into our mixer, nice and warm. We wanna start off with about half of our butter and milk mixture. We can always add more. Mix up. Now I'm adding the whip attachment. Start on slow speed until everything's combined and then whip it up until it's nice and fluffy. So now we're just gonna get these mashers right in there. Oh yeah, look at them. Okay. Thanks for following on for today's chef tip. For this recipe and all our recipes, go to platethestate.com. We're getting there to sunnier days, being with the ones we love, and now with those you've missed. This is you remastering the art of life. And while you're getting back at it, we'll be here to help you master the art of money. Norway Savings. Live your life in color. This week's pantry tip is brought to you by Norway Savings Bank. Hi, and welcome to today's pantry tip. I'm here to admit a bit of a secret, and that's I don't like pumpkin spice anything. I leave pumpkins and pies and the decorations. So, but I do love coffee. So I came up with an anti-pumpkin spice coffee drink that I'm gonna show you right now, and I hope you love as much as I do. We're still capturing these like sassy holiday flavors, but we're doing it in a different way. So we have cardamom, cinnamon spice, coriander, fresh orange peel, and star anise. So get a French press or however you like to strain your coffee. Um, I really like using this Vietnamese coffee. It's a fun little fact that their coffee beans are grown next to cacao plants, so it's kind of like nature's mocha, and you can taste a little bit of the chocolate in the coffee. So we're gonna do some heaping spoonfuls of that. Make sure you have your water boiling. And then all of these beautiful spices are gonna go in there. And don't worry, this whole recipe is on platesdate.com under pantry tips. Um, we have our boiling water. Okay, we're gonna let this sit for at least five minutes. If you want a stronger flavor, I did it for 10 the other day and it wasn't overpowering at all. So we're gonna let this sit and then press it down and I'll show you what to do next. All right, so now this is nice and infused. It's my favorite part. Fresh whipped cream. And I have to make a big bowl because I will literally eat all of this. And then we're going to put almost half into our mug. <laughs> All right. So if you're feeling a little extra decadent, you can take some like 70 to 80% chocolate and that just really in helps enhance all of the beautiful flavors, especially that chocolate that's naturally in Vietnamese coffee. And I'm making such a mess and it doesn't matter. All right. And now we have our magical antidote to all things pumpkin spice. And all of our pantry tips can be found at platethestate.com. I've been coming here for about 10 years. The best part of Harbor Fish is you smell the seafood, you hear the ice in the background. I love the fact that they're always ready to just make you the number one priority. 
my personal preference this evening would probably be the swordfish is what I would focus on. They can walk me through exactly what I'm looking for, for what recipe. I, when I was a chef, I could always trust that this is the best quality seafood for my guests. But I love the fact that like, this is where I shop for my fish for home too. It was the best part of both worlds. I come in here, I see chef friends, I see family friends, but I can trust that not only will the fishmongers here and the cutters and everybody working the counter will help me make the right choices and help me cook this fish the best way it can. Hi everybody, welcome back to Plate the State. We're gonna continue on with our fall inspired ingredients and I'm gonna show you this great side dish of some of this carnival squash, acorn squash. We have some great brown sugar, uh, espresso soaked raisins and some butter. This is gonna be one of those side dishes that's so easy to make, but people are gonna be talking about it for a while. Each one of these um, squash, we're going to cut into quarters or sixes, okay? All right. And then we're going to scoop out the seeds. Look at these squash from Robin. Look how beautiful they are. So now that these are all cleaned out, we're gonna take some of these espresso soaked raisins. Now raisins are obviously just dried grapes, so they're inherently pretty sweet. So by soaking them in some espresso, it gives them a much needed richness, but also a little bit of bitterness that's gonna help out, okay? So as you can see, I'm just sprinkling these around. Don't worry if any like fall out onto the pan, okay? Because what's gonna happen is once we get this brown sugar and the butter in there, it's gonna melt out and it's gonna make this nice bubbly caramel almost. And then what we're gonna do is be able to spoon that back on top before we serve it. And then we're just gonna finish with a little bit of salt and pepper. This squash is nice and soft, but I wanna show you what would happen if one was a little bit firm. You just wanna make a couple hash marks on either side, and that will help the ingredients seep into it, but also uh, make the squash cook a little bit faster and a little bit more tender. Now we wanna roast these off uh, 375 degrees for about 30, 35 minutes. You'll know if you take a knife and put it into the squash, it comes out, you know, little resistance and the squash is nice and tender, good color on it. Remember, don't worry about all the caramel that is made from the brown sugar. That gets spooned on top. I have some that I've made just to show you so you can see how like the caramel is made and those raisins got a little bit blistered here and that nice uh, sauce is now seeped into all of the wonderful squash there. Okay. So I don't mean to interrupt, but I found this and I wasn't sure if this was your attempt at some sort of centerpiece for dinner. <laughs> Funny enough, we're gonna make some hors d'oeuvres and I think hors d'oeuvres are such a great way to shine for the holidays and I have a really cool idea to show you. Right. So this is some bacon wrapped butternut squash that I dressed a little bit of more maple syrup onto the squash so it really gets this nice kind of caramelization color. Uh, I have some forged twigs here. I had a friend of mine just drill a hole into a little piece of wood here. We fit the twigs in there and then I'm gonna top these off with just a drop of truffle oil on these, okay? They'll naturally soak into the squash. It's gonna really play off that bacon. Mm, the smell is amazing. Truffle is one really of those smells. smells that... Really smells amazing, right? Mm. And over here, Maggie, I know you love this vegetarian cuisine. So we have some wonderful roast delicata squash, mm. local goat cheese, oregano, and some honey. Mm. Looks good, this oregano. Right? It smells so good. And it's keeping all the flavors of everything to come. I'm so excited to eat all this. And you might think that pairing beer and wine with squash is not very inspiring, but we found some great things to go with these. Right? So I'm so intrigued to see what you picked to go with this beautiful scape. Well, it wasn't very hard because beer and bacon go together so great. But Four Rivers Timber Hitch, this red ale beer, caramel notes, kind of like brown bready when you when you smell it. And it really goes well with the truffle oil, the bacon, the squash. I thought that's a great pair. And because all celebrations need to start with bubbles, Kat from Simpo Wine Co. recommended this incredible sparkling wine from Armenia that's aged for 22 months in this tiny village and it's just light, sparkling, and it's a perfect complement to these appetizers and to pretty much start <laughs> any meal. It's perfect. <laughs> We're gonna go enjoy these, and when we come back, Josh is gonna show us what to do with some leftovers. <laughs> I 
At Town & Country Federal Credit Union, our mobile app lets you do almost anything from anywhere. Deposit checks, pay bills, move money, and much more. And if you need us, we're always here to help. Learn more at tcfcu.com. Today's leftover ideas are brought to you by Town & Country Federal Credit Union, helping you stretch your food dollars. Hi, welcome to today's leftover idea. Out of all the leftover ideas that we've shown on this show, I think this one is probably the easiest, right? It's Thanksgiving. The best part of Thanksgiving is the leftovers. Now, when I was in the restaurant, my sous chef Matt and I would make hundreds of turkey sandwiches and we would give one to every single person that left. And the looks on their face that they got this turkey sandwich, it was priceless. They'd read book for next year right then and there. I wanna show you guys how to make that sandwich. So we're gonna start with some of this great honey spelt bread, sourdough, so it's got like that nice aroma to it, but it's also the sesame seed crunch on the outside, it's delicious. So we're gonna first start, I don't toast it, I just like, I like the nice soft bread. I have a cranberry mayonnaise right here. So it's some of the cranberry sauce that was left over and I mixed in a little bit of mayonnaise. So I'm gonna spread that on one side. Now because we all love our carbs, I'm gonna start with some of that stuffing that we made, right? It actually has some of the same bread, lots of onions, lots of celery. Remember, this was a very vegetable forward stuffing, so I love that. It's got that nice stock in there that we made with the onion peels. On the other side, I'm gonna take some of our mashed potatoes, spread those mashers right in there. Now, Matt used to make a slaw that went on it, and that was delicious. But I like using some of this nice, festive, little bit of lettuce in here. Then I like putting my turkey in the middle. Look how juicy that turkey is. That's that brine. And then I'm gonna finish off a little bit of local cheddar cheese right on top. Oh, look at that sandwich. All right, we're gonna put this turkey sandwich just like that. There, perfect. And this sandwich just <laughs> leads you into a very long nap. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Hancock Lumber for letting us film in their beautiful studio kitchen down in Kennebunk. Thanks to all of you for watching and following along at Plate the State and on our website, platethestate.com. And to wherever your appetite takes you on Thanksgiving and all throughout the year. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. <laughs>